It is my joy to welcome you to today's podcast. Our prayer is that the Lord will minister to you in a special way during our time together. So I grew up in Hyderabad and I studied in a school called St. John's Church High School. Uh, Anybody from St. John's here? Oh, it, oh, yeah, we have three legends here. Yeah, okay, four, five, six. So uh, my next question is, so how many of you have gone to a Christian school here? Okay, thank you. How many of you have gone to a non-Christian school, like international school or whatever school it is? How many of you, of you never went to a school, but you just made it up in life? Like, you, you're a successful CEO, but you never may went to a school. Okay, the reason I'm asking you that question is because, so in my school, we would have assembly time. And in our assembly time, we would eventually, once a week, do something very, very spiritual. So let me ask you, anybody here who went to a convent school or a Christian school, learned something spiritual in your assembly time? Yes, what is that? Sorry? The Lord's Prayer, lovely, 10 points to you. I'm sure you passed in your exams. Yeah, so the Lord's Prayer, I think that was one of our things that we learned. That was, in fact, the first English prayer I learned in my school. So we, I, when, when I learned that prayer, we, I would come back home, and then I, um, then I taught uh, my mom and dad. They never spoke in English. So, uh, so I started, we started praying in our family. I said, I learned a new prayer. Let's, let's pray it out. And then we would all eventually repeat that. So this morning time, I want to give you an opportunity for all the people who did not go to school or who did not go to Christian school, we're going to teach you this prayer this morning time. Is that okay? So would you please stand up on your feet? And uh, it will be on your screen right now. So we're going to all look at this prayer and let's pray this prayer, okay? So here we go. Are you ready for that? Say yes. Thank you. Let's go. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. You did such a fabulous job. So, this is called the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, and around the world, probably one of the most favorite prayers, uh, recited, prayed, sung, uh, and, you know, you, widely used all around the world. Didn't, doesn't matter who you are, but you know this prayer. Absolutely, you know this prayer. But before going to this prayer, this is found in Matthew chapter 6. I just want to tell you, I just want to do a context for you. Why was this prayer made or taught? And what is just before that? So Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 8 tells Jesus teaches them what prayer should not be or what prayer is not. And this is how it goes, Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, They have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. So that is the context. And then Jesus says in verse 9, this then how you should pray. I love that phrase. So I've just entitled my message this morning time, just pray like that. Simple. Just pray like that. So Jesus is telling what not to pray, how not to pray. This is not the way you should pray. And he starts off saying that, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to stand in the marketplace. In fact, 
little later, you see in the Gospels that Jesus was talking about two men, a parable of a Pharisee and a tax collector. Both of them went to the temple to pray. And uh, Jesus telling the story says, two men went to the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood himself and prayed, God, I thank you. I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. That's brilliant. So Jesus is saying, hey, don't be like that Pharisee who was so proud. He would, probably he stood at the corner, at the top of his voice, he made all that prayer. Thank you, Lord, I'm so good. I give my tithes. I'm such a great guy. People love me and I love you with all my heart and all that. And everybody heard it like, wow, what a great prayer. You know, it's interesting when, when you hear people pray. Some of them pray King James Version. Some of them pray really loud. Some people pray. We don't even know when to say amen. And like, we have different kind of prayer. But this man, Jesus says, the tax collector, humble man, just said, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, this man home went home justified. Brilliant. So Jesus saying, this is the way you need to pray. So when you look at the Lord's Prayer, six petitions are there. The first three is all about yours. That means heavenward. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. All pointing towards heaven. Jesus starts off teaching the prayer. He says, hey, first it's all about God. It's all about heaven. It's about the kingdom of God. Then the next three petitions come. Give us today provision. Forgive our sins, pardon, and lead us not in temptation, protect, protection. Then it comes home, very, very personal. That's the whole way the whole prayer is divided. Matthew 6, when we see that, Jesus is teaching, you start off by thanking God first, praising him. And that's why we have such a lovely, lovely worship time. Even before you get into a prayer time or the message, we exalt God. We praise him for who he is. And then you come to the prayer time and then the message time. That's the way it should go. Don't just go bang on, Jesus, I need this. Bye, I'll see you later. We put our shopping list and walk away. Hey, wait for a minute. Exalt the name of Jesus. Verse 9 says, Jesus saying, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. That's relationship. That's total relationship. Father and son, daughter and a father again. So Jesus, when he was on the earth, he made lots of prayers, absolutely. Early in the morning and late in the nights, all night prayers. And no wonder the disciples were so impressed, not by the, just the miracles, but like, wow, Jesus is a man of prayer. Let's go and ask him, teach us to pray. And I know we have good intentions. We read about prayer, we hear about prayer, we, we talk about prayer, but it's so hard to pray. Yes or no? Some of us find it the most difficult thing is just to sit alone with God and pray, focus. Then when you sit there, probably Netflix is coming into your mind, internet, your boss, and all the targets, everything is coming. But if you can just sit and pray, that'll be so awesome. And Jesus starts off saying, our Father in heaven. So this prayer is found both in Matthew and Luke. And Matthew is a pattern of prayer. Luke is a form of prayer. Matthew is a little more elaborate. Luke is a little more short. But they combine both and it makes a lovely prayer. In Luke, he starts off uh, addressing God as Father. But in Matthew, he says, Our Father. So this is a community prayer. This is not just like an individual prayer, but this is a community prayer. How do we know that? Look at the plurals. Our Father, not my Father. Jesus could have very well said, my Father in heaven, but he taught us our Father, which includes your neighbor whom you don't like also. Our Father, give us 
forgive us, deliver us, is plural, is inclusive, is a community prayer. Corporate prayer is a church prayer. And it's so beautiful and so rightly fitting when you pray in your families, when you pray with your church members, when you pray like that. And definitely, this is not the prayer, it's a model prayer. So Jesus didn't say, this is the way you should pray. This is the way you can pray. He gave us a model. And I love the way that he starts off. The whole central theme is father, pita, papa, daddy. I don't know what you call your father, but he starts off like that. And Jesus didn't just walk in and call God his father. In fact, God, throughout the Old Testament, looking at Israel, is calling them. In, in fact, in Deuteronomy 32, he says, is he not your father, your creator? And we look in Jeremiah 31, 9. It says, because I'm Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Psalm 103, you will love this. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So throughout the Old Testament, we're seeing, and Jesus now comes and establishes that relationship. In fact, Jesus uh, calls him, Abba, if you have watched Passion of the Christ, the Gethsemane scene and many, many other scenes, he always says, Abba, Abba, which means father in Aramaic. It's not Hebrew, it's not Greek, it's Aramaic, that's the language Jesus spoke. So God is our loving father and we need to be his sons. In, Jesus says in uh, John saying that some of you belong to your father, the devil, you don't belong to me. That means there are people who belong to the devil. Some people are orphaned. They don't know who to belong. But Jesus is giving you an open invitation this morning time. And he says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. Isn't that exciting? You thought that only Jesus could call God his father. But guess what? You and I are adopted in that family. Everyone who makes that prayer, Jesus come into my heart. No, you have a relationship with Jesus. You establish a father and son relationship and you can call God his father, Abba, father. They say that um, your basic concept of God comes through your human fathers. Children who grew up, who grew up in, in homes, Christian homes especially, they begin to picture God when they see their father, either good or bad. It all depends on what kind of examples we're giving. So I, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a pastor's home, rather. My dad was an evangelist. He prayed, he read his Bible, and he gave me such an amazing picture of God. That man never smoked, nor drank, nor beat his wife, nor cheated on his wife, provided for all his children. He worked hard. A picture will come uh, now. And all his life, he worked so hard. And looking at him, I'm like, wow. How can a human be so kind, so good? Such a nice guy. No, he was not a perfect father. Definitely not. He made mistakes. Uh, he did uh, things which were probably not perfect, but he was a good man. He was a godly man. I looked at his wife, uh, life and just said, if this is how you can love God, I want to follow that God. So I grew up in that home praying that God, I want to, I want to love Jesus like the way my father does. And then I got married to a beautiful wife, Ujwala, and then, then after a few one year probably, we had our first kid, Jonathan, that's Joey, and uh, I hope you get a picture there. Yeah, that's Joey. So that, that's in my father's house, so we used to stay together for a few years. So Jonathan came along, and he grew every inch, every month. Uh, it's amazing to see his picture. Like, what, so people would come and ask me, what are you feeding him? And my simple answer was, should I tell you, Joey? <laughs> we give him pedigree, yeah, that, and that's how kids grow up, yeah. <laughs> So, and then after a few years came Ria, the most beautiful girl ever, and that really pleased my heart. And that changed my life, absolutely. 
from just following a father to being a father right now, my love and respect for my parents went really high. Like, wow, you did an amazing job. We were four kids in the family. Like, I don't know how you did that. I'm just not able to manage two. <laughs> but it was such a beautiful experience for me. Absolutely changed my life completely. Everything I have to change. My patience level went high, long suffering, uh, forgiveness, uh, <laughs> and you know, caring, loving them. But I loved every moment of that. I poured my life into them and I would often tell myself, I'll give my life for these kids. Even if I don't have to do anything in my life, just take care of them, I'll gladly do that. But one more thing which really helped me was to know God better. Hey, and Joey and Ria are here, right in the first bench, why don't you just come up? Yeah, let's do a live demo as how you look right now. And that you really are my kids. And I couldn't use any other kids because that'll be a legal problem. So I said, I told them, you better come for both the service. And they did. They came for the first service. They sat through. And uh, just let me tell you that. I think one of the best gifts that I ever got in my life was Joey and Ria. And uh, I would do anything to get you back. <laughs> so thank you for you know, showing me God's love and giving me the opportunity to love you, to mentor you, and I will do that all over again. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's all your partners, and you can go back now. So, when, when I think about God right now, when I think about Jesus, when I think about the Father, I'm like, wow, how perfect my Heavenly Father can be. And then when we read the Gospels of the prodigal son, don't worry, we're not getting there, you know the story. But when you read the whole story, how, how a loving father handling two sons, one lost outside, one lost inside only. Both are lost only. And how, how he amazingly balances them, loves them, forgives them. So beautifully, God is showing a picture of a father who doesn't care what the son did, but just running to him in spite of all that, loves him, embraces him. But I want to really tell you a, a true story from uh, the book called What's So Amazing About This Grace from Philip Yancey, a great writer. And he writes about a girl, a young girl who grew up in Michigan in a Christian home, uh, very strict father and mother, go to church, read the Bible, and uh, no wearing short skirts, no ring, nose ring, listen to clean music. And one day this girl gets really fed up of all that strict discipline and she decides to run away. She runs away to the nearest city, Detroit. And there on the second day, she meets a man uh, who, who drove the biggest car in town. He gives her a ride, takes her to a penthouse and houses her there for two months. Life was good there for her, gives her luxury, TV, money, shopping, Everything was really going good for her until this man began to teach her horrible things which only men liked. She was a minor and men paid premium price for her just to spend a night with her. She did that over and over and over and again until she lost her identity. Every time she would look in the mirror, she would look different right now. Not the girl that ran away from the home, but become a woman whom nobody could recognize. One day she sees her own picture in the newspaper. Have you seen this girl? And if yes, please call this number. She looked at the picture, she looked at herself, two different people all together now. This went on for two years until the boss got fed up with her. He took all her money, her possessions, and he threw her out. He says, I don't need you, get out. People are not coming for you now, we got better people. She walked on the street, and she was lying on a bench one cold winter night. Suddenly, the pain stabbed her saying that, God, why did I leave my home? I'm so far away and nobody loves me. I don't have money and I'm hungry right now and I don't know where to go. She decides to call home. Three straight calls lands on the answering machine. But the fourth one, she decides, I'll leave a message. She says, Dad, I'm wondering if I can come back home. I'm catching a bus at midnight, and that is going to cross the town. I'll be very happy if you can come 
to the bus station. If not, I will head for Canada. It was a seven hour journey that she was traveling. And she began to think about home. She began to think about all the things that she learned as a kid. And she began to practice a sorry speech, thinking, what will I tell my father? How will they react? I hope they got my message. I hope they have not written me off dead. Finally, the bus reaches the station. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. As the bus comes there, on the concrete wall and the chairs, they were grouped almost about 40 people, uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters, grandmother, grandfather, all of them waiting with party, uh, party poppers and all the whistles, and they were just clapping and cheering for her. And they had one big banner called, Welcome Back Home. Welcome Back Home. She got down from there not knowing what to say. She went and embraced her father saying that, Father, I'm sorry. And, she's, and he said, don't worry, Bita. We have many things to talk. We have a big banquet and a party. Let's go home. Let's go home. All forgiven, all forgotten. Welcome back home. That's the picture of you and me. That's the picture of a heavenly father who's waiting to receive you. So, no matter what you've done this morning time, we have a father who's waiting. You just need to come back home. And this father calls us his sons and daughters. We are his. We belong to him. So you can never run away. There's one way back home. That's to take a U-turn and say, Jesus, please forgive me. Come back home. That's the picture Jesus gives us. The second thing that we see is God, who art in heaven. God is a sovereign God. Remember, he's your loving father, but also a sovereign God. We need to approach him with a balance. You don't treat him like the way you treat your own father. And some of, of us probably have treated our fathers very, very badly. I don't know what names you call him, old man, old chap, that cranky man. I don't know what you call him. We call names to our father, but not so with God. Definitely not. He's, he, you need to maintain that reverence. You need to maintain that balance. And if you have not do, done that, that's not good. Because this is what God says in Isaiah. For thus says the one who is high and lifted, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place and also with those who are contrite and low in spirit to revive the spirit of the low and to revive the hearts of the contrite. Here's a mighty God. He's just not sitting on the earth, but who art in heaven. So remember the balance. Don't get too pally. Absolutely not. But I love, as I, I couldn't say much when my kids were there, but I love my kids where we have great time, fun, we, have, we fight, we joke, we can do all that. But when it comes to respecting, I've never seen them disrespect me in any way. They know the balance. No, I'm not saying they're perfect kids. Definitely not. Nor am I a perfect father. We have a long way to go. We probably with an L board and we're all just learning. I don't know when we will graduate and get the master's degree. Maybe never. But we, I love their attitude. Even though Joey is taller than me, I tell them, Joey, no. That means no. Go sit down. You're not going. And I love that balance. I think some of us forget that with our God. We take him for granted. As we make this prayer, he is our loving dad, but also a sovereign God. Sovereign God. And that leads us to the second point. Hallowed be thy name. So a kid was reciting the Lord's prayer, and this is how he said, Our Father who art in heaven, how do you know my name? Cute, no? But he knows your name. He knows your phone number. He knows where you're staying. So hallowed be thy name. That's reverence. Absolutely reverence. 
And how do we disrespect God? You know, I know some of the people who do not know God can curse God. In our movies, we see, you know, people cursing God all the time and just boils my blood. Like, okay, just shut the TV, walk off. I like it. Just really drives you mad to see people cursing God or using God's name like that. But do you know that we as Christians are guilty of that? Many times we use God's name in vain. We keep saying things which not supposed to say sometimes. Maybe some of us got into such a habit that drop off anything, we just say, oh Jesus. I'm like, I know, God will not strike you dead. Definitely not. But I'm just saying how we need to be careful, how we need to rever that name. It's one of the third commandment. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So we need to be careful how we use that name. Definitely, you know, God has probably, God is more kinder than, than me probably, or you. Uh, he will forgive us. But just look at that, the way that you use God's name. In the Old Testament, people's name told their personality and their character. And we read throughout the Bible the names of God. Elohim, which means the strong one. El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Yon, the most high God. Yahweh. He is God, a self-existent. He doesn't have a beginning nor the end. Adonai, master. So these are the titles which the Bible tells us and we need to take it very, very carefully. In fact, in the Old Testament, people would not dare to call the names of God. They were so careful, so careful that they never prayed also probably. They never even looked to heaven. To heaven. That's one more extreme. No, just have, find the balance. Absolutely balance. And... Each time they would write the name, they would just miss some vowels there, miss some words, and they would not, if they had to write God, they would just write G and D, missing the O, or Lord, L-R-D. That's how they revered that name. And in fact, the Bible translation, when each time they would write the name of God, they would stand up, break that pen, go take bath, change their clothes, come down, take a new pen and ink, and then write the name of God. That's how they revered it. That's the reverence that they had. And I guess we need to do that. We need to have reverence for that name. Hallowed be thy name. And God tells, uh, Peter says that, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And if God is calling us that, how do we defame that name? By our testimonies. We can have the Christian name or we can wear the Christian jewelry. We can do all that. And if we are living a bad life, bad testimony, that's how we defame God. We need to have clean testimonies because people are watching us, whether you like it or not. Oh, your name is John. Oh, oh your name is Paul. People know that you are a Christian. Oh, you have a Christian name and you do all these things. There's no difference between you and me. Bro, we are same. So let's, let's go to the pub and then do whatever we have to do. We, we can do things like that. Take the name of God seriously in your family, at your work, your business, in your finances, in everything, your thought life, your habits, because it matters. The story is told about great Alexander the Great where he had a coat and in that court session, a, a man was brought for cowardice. He, he ran away from the battle and he was caught and brought to kill King Alexander. And King Alexander asked him, young man, what is your name? And this man knew that he had the power of life or death. He could pronounce that. He said, Alexander, sir. Alexander got up from his throne. He says, what is your name? He says, Alexander. At this, Alexander walked up to that man. Tell me what is your name? And he said, with shaky voice, Alexander. King Alexander looked at him and said, either you change your conduct or change your name. I wonder what God would tell some of us like that. Either you change your name or your conduct. But Jesus is saying, when you go to pray, close the door. Close the door and pray in secret because your heavenly father who's unseen will see you and reward you. So 
It's amazing that we need to just really see what kind of prayers we are following. Sometimes it could be repetitive, taking the name of Jesus a thousand times, or doing this, or many, many forms that we have, right? But Jesus says simply this, go, close the door, sit, and pray personally, and God will reward you powerfully, absolutely, powerfully. Some of the prayers Will be, uh, will be answered when you can probably just take time to sit alone with God. It'll be awesome to see just you and God kneeling down and doing things. I think some of my best prayers were answered when I was all alone with God, either in my fasting prayers or on my terrace or in my room. I just sat there because there's no pretense, right? Nobody's hearing you, what kind of language you're using or how many scriptures you're using. You just talk to God. You walk and talk to God. Sometimes your prayer can be just tears. You don't have to say much. And Jesus is saying, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the heavenly father will give to those who ask. So sit alone with God. Talk to him because he loves you and he loves to hear your prayers. What are some of the ways that we can magnify his name, glorify his name? Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. We don't defame his name, but we elevate him. First Corinthians says, Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You are ambassadors of Christ. People are watching you, so let's live good and holy lives. Number three is your kingdom come. This is the reign of Christ. Praying for his kingdom. We're asking God to come into our hearts, into our lives. It doesn't mean a geographical one. It doesn't mean even Israel. It means your life. Jesus coming and invading in your life. Jesus is coming and reigning in your life. You open your heart and your life and the kingdom of God comes into you. You become a changed person altogether and then you become a change agent. That's what it means to be the kingdom of God. The, in fact, uh, I.J. Packer says, what is the kingdom of God? It simply means God's kingdom is not a place, but it is a relationship with God. And that kingdom came when Jesus came. He inaugurated that kingdom. And ever since that, people have been carrying on that kingdom. In fact, Jesus preached about uh, the kingdom of God in all his ministry. He always preached about in, on his parables about the kingdom of God. There are eight parables that he speaks only about the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's not fulfilled yet. And Jesus is teaching in this prayer, let your kingdom come. That means there is still more work to be done. Injustice, hunger, sickness, you know, so many wrong things are happening in this world. And have you ever wondered why? Because the kingdom is not fully come. And Jesus is teaching, hey, pray for the complete establishment of his kingdom. And that's why we need to gather together. And that's why we need to pray together for the kingdom. That's why we come in corporate prayer. That's why we pray together for our city, for our nation, for so many things which are happening wrong in our city or in our nation. We come together together. And we are saying, let your kingdom come. Every city which God visited was never the same again. Revival swept through. People who used to smoke or drink or, or robbery or murder or rape changed because the kingdom of God came in that place. Max Lucoro said, the kingdom come. You are inviting the Messiah to walk into your world. Come, be my king. Take your throne in our land. Be present in my heart. Be, the pres be present in my office. Come into my marriage. Be the Lord of my family, my fears, my doubts. This is a bold prayer. Absolutely. But when you make that prayer, lives change. The second thing that we see is that we expand his kingdom. 
how do we do that? We expand. So the story is told about a Roman Empire. In their heydays, they would invade many lands. And they kept getting bigger and bigger. And Caesar would often send his army and his people wherever the territory is and change the whole location there. How would they do that? They would first make temples there. There were many, many big Roman temples. Caesar was a worship uh, god there. They all worshipped Caesar. But they would also change the education, arts, culture, build Roman baths, and do everything to make the new territory look like Rome. And the big question is, why would they do that? Why would Caesar send people to do that? Simple. Because every time Caesar visited that place, he would feel like home. It'll be no different. Same language, culture, Roman bath, everything. He would feel like home. And guess what? Jesus is doing the same thing on the earth. He wants to build his kingdom. He wants to change everything. Because when Jesus comes back on the earth, he will feel home. He will feel home. Amen? He will say, hey, this is home. And that's why Jesus is teaching us. Let your kingdom come. And the fourth one is, let your will be done. This is a rule. Praying for his will to be done in our lives. You know, probably one of the greatest things as Christians we do is seek God's will in everything, right? In our jobs, in our marriages, uh, in our lives, where we move, uh, should we move to Australia or, or England or wherever, in your children, education, everything is all about, I'm seeking God's will. And that's perfect. Let your will be done. But you know what Jesus is teaching us? Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So do you know what heaven looks like? What goes on in, earth, in heaven? There's only one rule, God's rule. No opposition there, absolutely nothing. If God says it, it's done. If God wills it, it's done. If God plans it, it is done. And Jesus is saying, let God's will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus is teaching us not just earthly life, but he's saying, hey, look beyond that. If you want God's will to be done, then God is saying, my will is that everyone should be saved. None should perish. That is the will of God. What is the will of God? That you live holy and sanctified lives. That is the will of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. God wants us to do that. That's firstly. But definitely, there are many, many things that we seek, right? Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely seek for it. But God is saying, hey, first is heavenwards and then earthward. All your will submitting to God. That's what Jesus did, right? While he was on the earth, he came to a moment where he, he was on the earth. Just before the cross, praying in Gethsemane. He's praying to his father, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. What was Jesus praying for? He was simply saying, God, Father, Abba, is there another way? Apart from the cross, apart from the suffering, apart from the separation. He made that prayer not once, not twice, but thrice. But I love the fact that he said, not my will, but yours be done. Now that is a bold prayer. If you have guts, pray like that. If you don't, don't pray. Just keep doing what you have to do. But if you want God's will to be done in your life, then add that. Not my will, but yours be done. And because he said that, Father didn't change the cross. He didn't change that cross. He let him go through it. In fact, he said, carry it and go. All the way to the crucifixion, to death. But God gave him that victory. Today, there is no other name in heaven or on earth or under earth higher than the name of Jesus because he was obedient to his father. Amen. If you are seeking God's will, then go for it. All out. Not 50-50, God, if it's your will, let's do a 
Bata, let's trade 50-50, but he gave it all. He gave it all. And no wonder God gave him the highest name ever. This morning time, as the worship team comes, can I ask you to close your eyes, please? There are some of you probably sitting here who are still not part of the kingdom of God. You have not surrendered to Christ. But this morning, you can make that prayer. And it's as simple as asking Jesus to wash your sins away, to write your name in his book. And you belong to his kingdom. So if there's anybody here, anybody who's saying, I want to be a part of that kingdom, come on. If that is you, lift up your hands. And right now, in this very moment, God will write your name. He'll forgive your sin. You can become the son or a daughter of God. Come on, anybody here. You just have to lift up your hands and tell Jesus, this is my life and I surrender to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. If you have asked Jesus to come into your heart, but you've never been kingdom-minded, it was all about your life, your family, your job, your money, everything earthly, but, but you've never given to be the kingdom person. But this morning I'm saying, hey, it's not about me. The reason I'm here, it's about God and his kingdom. And that's what Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I promise you, all these things which Jesus promised, which you need for this life, he will add unto you, but you seek his kingdom. If that is you, you lift up your hand and say, Jesus, this is my hand, Lord. I want to work for you. I want to be a kingdom person. Hallelujah. Thank you for taking time to listen. If you would like more information about our church or would like to make a comment, please mail us at info at newlifeag.in. God bless you.